Well, good morning. Here we are on day two of our journey in distance learning. I've got Harper here for you. She is, I uh, just wanted to say hello. Holman and Harper in the morning. Good times. Um, she won't leave me alone, so she keeps trying to get up. So I thought I would uh, bring her up. In case you didn't get to the end of the video yesterday, you wouldn't have gotten to see dear old Harper. Uh, dear young Harper. She's still a puppy. Anywho. Let's get to it, shall we? Today we are going to be looking at Act 3, Scene 2 of Romeo and Juliet. Yesterday, Act 3, Scene 1 was quite the turning point. We had Mercutio murdered at the hands of Tybalt, who was there to really murder Romeo. Uh, Mercutio reacted for Romeo, for his best friend. Romeo was, was basically saying, I love you, Tybalt. You don't know why I love you. Obviously, we know why he loves him, but um, as a cousin. Mercutio is not having it calm, vile, dishonorable submission, he yells before he charges into the battle and fights Tybalt. Mercutio might have beaten Tybalt. However, Romeo intervened and was trying to stop them from fighting. And so Tybalt took the opportunity and stabbed Mercutio under Romeo's arm. Very sad. And then Mercutio, as he's dying, is shouting, a plague on both your houses. A plague on both your houses. He curses Mercush, excuse me, he curses Montague and Capulet alike as he's dying. And then Romeo saying that his spirit is hovering just a little bit over our heads. When he finally confronts Tybalt, he says, either thou or I or both shall join Mercutio. Okay? And of course, it's Tybalt who ends up, well, I don't know if he joins Mercutio, he might be more of a southern kind of guy that Tybalt. Anyway, we pick up with Act 3, Scene 2. Juliet knows nothing about it. Juliet is blissfully unaware, looking forward to her wedding night, looking forward to Romeo climbing that rope ladder to see her and so that they can consummate their marriage. So she uh, she speaks a soliloquy that honestly is one of the most beautiful pieces of English literature um, that Shakespeare wrote here. Uh, the soliloquy as she's looking forward to it. As we read Pay attention to the figurative language. Pay attention to, uh, remember, figurative language is personification, hyperbole, uh, metaphor, and simile, right? Those are your four, your four pillars of figurative language. So look for those, but also pay attention to the allusions. Shakespeare uses allusions to great effect. So he, he'll reference uh, something from Greek and Roman culture that the, uh, the upper class people in the, in the higher, the, the, the expensive seats would get more so than the groundlings would. But we, of course, have excellent footnotes that let us know who these people are, that the general audience, the more learned audience, the people in the upper chambers of the globe would have gotten fairly easily. So uh, we're going to start with Juliet alone in Capulet's mansion. So I'm going to make myself small real quick. All right. To Juliet alone. She says, Gallop apace, you fiery-footed steeds, toward Phoebus' lodging. Such a wagoner as Phaeton would whip you to the west and bring in cloudy night immediately. Spread thy close curtain, love performing night, that runaway's eyes may wink and Romeo leap to these arms, untalked of and unseen. Lovers can see to do their amorous rites by their own beauties, or if love be blind, it best agrees with night. Come, civil night, thou sober-suited matron all in black, and learn me how to lose a winning match played for a pair of stainless maidenhoods. Could my unmanned blood baiting in my cheeks with thy black mantle till strange love grow bold? Think true love acted simple modesty. Come night, come Romeo, come thou day and night, for thou wilt lie upon the wings of night whiter than new snow upon a raven's back. Come gentle night, Come, loving, black-browed knight, give me my Romeo. And when I shall die, take him and cut him out in little stars, and he will make that face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. Oh, I have bought the mansion of a love, but not possessed it, and though I am sold, not yet enjoyed. So tedious is this day, as is the night before some festival to an impatient child that hath new robes and may not wear them. 
All right, we read it completely through. Now I want to go back and um, analyze a bit more. All right, this is a huge soliloquy for Juliet. She starts out with gallop apace, you fiery-footed steeds. Gallop apace, move quickly. The horses are galloping. We get this image of of the the sun god's chariot. Phoebus is another name for the sun god. Oh, here's the cat. Okay. All right, kitty. Say hello and then say goodbye. Um, toward Phoebus's lodging, such a wagoner as Phaeton would whip you to the west and bring in cloudy night immediately. Now, Phaeton was the son of Phoebus. He drove the horses pulling his father's chariot so recklessly that Zeus killed him with a thunderbolt. So she wants the day and night to be to be reckless. She wants that Phaeton take over the chariot and bring cloudy night now. Bring it immediately. Phaeton was murdered by Zeus, <laughs> killed by a thunderbolt because he did it wrong. She wants Phaeton to do it wrong and bring night as quickly as possible. Okay? She's waiting to see her her love. Okay. Now Juliet continues her her pleading tonight. She personifies night. She says, "Spread thy close curtain." love performing night. Night is personified as that which is going to allow her to perform love. Runaway's eyes may wink, uh, and Romeo leap to these arms, untalked of and unseen. She talks about lovers do their amorous rites by their own beauties. If love be blind, at best agrees with night. Notice, think about the fact that Romeo's most famous soliloquy is talking about how Juliet is the sun, you know? Um... But soft what light through yonder window breaks. Tis the east and Juliet is the sun. And there's all this imagery of Juliet being the source of the, of light. And now we have Juliet praising night rather than, than light. And so she's looking forward to what night will bring, which is Romeo. Romeo will come in the night. And so she is looking forward to it. So we have kind of a, an interesting, an interesting contrast, interesting way that it's kind of reversed. Romeo is talking about how she is the sun and Julia is completely associating uh, Romeo with the night. Uh, she personifies here, civil night, thou sober suited matron all in black. So again, personifying it. And she tells that matron, teach me how to lose a winning match played for a pair of stainless maidenhoods. We know maidenhoods are virginity. So when she talks about the losing match, she wants to lose that winning match. That is for her, um, her maidenhood. Um, she talks about the black mantle, still str strange love, grow bold, think true love, acted simple modesty. And then she pleads tonight, come night. Come Romeo, Romeo comes with night, come thou day and night. Romeo is the day and night. Everything else is dark and Romeo um, will be her day. She compares uh, Romeo here to um, basically the, the beautiful freshly fallen snow on a raven's back. So just like he's the day and night, he would be the snow on a raven's back. She says, give me my Romeo. And then there's this reference to when I shall die. She references her own death. And when she does, that they should cut up Romeo and turn him into stars in heaven. And it would make the face of heaven so fine that the whole world will be in love with night. And pay no worship to the garish sun. Remember Romeo's soliloquy, he told her to rise up and kill the moon. And now she's saying that Romeo, once he makes everyone in love with night, um, people will pay no worship to the garish sun. So this idea of the luminaries in the sky um, is revisited in this soliloquy. She says, I've bought the mansion of a love, but not possessed it. Again, she's married, but they haven't consummated the marriage. She says, though I'm sold, not yet enjoyed. Same thing, right? You know what I'm talking about. So tedious is this day, as is the night before some festival to an impatient child that hath new robes and may not wear them. So she compares herself to a child who has new clothes to wear the next day and is so excited to wear her new outfit. Um, and she uh, has to suffer through the night, the, the day, um, the night before to get to the festival to wear her robes. And by wear her robes, we of course mean uh, Romeo. So thinking about the soliloquy there's a couple of uh of things that i want to point out to you there's a gives an insight remember my book i read my book she gives an insight uh into juliet's mind um as you as you read notice how uh some of the words uh echo uh, are concerned with speed or haste words like gallop fiery footed whip and so on 
Um, but then also there are words that connect with night and darkness. Okay. How do you think those patterns uh, created by such words convey what Juliet is thinking and feeling? Speeding towards the darkness, essentially. There's also an indication of trouble ahead. Although Julia is incredibly happy as she awaits her wedding night, her soliloquy contains at least three references to death. The image of the youthful, headstrong Phaeton, who was murdered for doing it wrong. <laughs> Good old Zeus. Her own death, she references, and her imagining of Romeo's body in the heavens. These quotations are important in the script opposite. They add to the overall mood of Juliet's soliloquy, which, which is, which is, passionate and, and also shows some impatience but at the same time references death several times um some of the some of the lines in the speech this uh, my book is pointing out are quite sexual in previous centuries some productions cut these lines um which might have been challenging for an actor playing juliet um in different in a different era okay um so here juliet is passionately revealing the depth of her longing for romeo critics call her 31 lines an epithalamium or a wedding song. All right. So just a couple of side points. At the end of her soliloquy, she, um, oops, I'm on the wrong page. There we are. She says, oh, here comes my nurse, and enter the nurse with the cords, the ladder of cords uh, that she is carrying. She says, oh, here comes my nurse, and she brings news, and every tongue that speaks but Romeo's name speaks heavenly eloquence. So she's still kind of lost in her her wedding song. Now, nurse, what news? What hast thou there? The cords that Romeo bid thee fetch? The nurse says, I, I, the cords. And she throws them down in my version. Juliet, I, me, what news? Why dost thou wring thy hands? She's, she's wringing her hands. This is what you do when you wring your hands, showing that you're upset about something that's happened. So Juliet's like, what is the news? Nurse says, oh, well, a day, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. We are undone, lady, we are undone. Alack the day, he's gone, he's killed, he's dead. Juliet hears that and notices that there is no antecedent to the nurse's <laughs> uh, he, and so she thinks that she's talking about Romeo, and she says, can heaven be so envious? Can heaven be so envious? Envious. Heaven wants what she has, and so it has taken Romeo. At least this is what Juliet's assuming from what the nurse has stated. She says, can heaven be so envious? And the nurse says, Romeo can, though heaven cannot. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, whoever would have thought it, Romeo. Again, she hasn't told her <laughs> Romeo's not dead. Juliet thinks he, that he is. There's some verbal irony as well as dramatic irony. So this scene is just dripping with irony. Juliet says, what devil art thou that dost torment me thus? This torture should be roared in dismal hell. Hath Romeo slain himself? Say thou but I, and that bare vowel I shall poison more than the death-darting eye of cockatrice. I am not I, if there be such an I, or those eyes shut that makes thee answer I. If he be slain, say I, or if not, no. Brief sounds determine of my weal or woe. Weal is short for wealth, so brief sounds determine if it's if it's wealth or woe, if it is happiness or pain. So she asks her, uh, she's like, you're tormenting me. She calls her a devil, Juliet does here. And then there's this play on the sound I. I, as in first person pronoun, I as in A-Y meaning yes, and then eyes as in these things, ojos, okay? So uh, there's a play on here. Elizabethans not only enjoyed joking puns, of which Mercutio was a master, uh, but also appreciated them in tragic situations. In these lines, Juliet and the nurse repeatedly use one vowel sound, I. However, this repetitive wordplay can appear forced and contrived to a modern audience at such a serious moment in the play um, this, this, they're kind of punning on the word I. But she says, if you say I, yes, then I am no longer me. I can't be me if Romeo is gone. She says that that, that word, A-Y, I, meaning yes, is going to poison her more than the death-darting eye of cockatrice. The cockatrice was a basilisk, a legendary beast. It was half snake, half cockerel or rooster, and its stare could kill. 
So it's stare. I believe it would turn you to stone. This just says kill, but I believe it would turn you to stone. So the death darting eye of cockatrice. It, but that word I saying yes, that Romeo has killed himself would be enough to kill her in an instant. Mm -hmm. Um, so they, they're, they're punning on this. She says, please tell me, is it my weal or woe? Is it my happiness or my pain? Nurse says, I saw the wound. I saw it with mine eyes. God save the mark here on his manly breast. A piteous corpse, a bloody piteous corpse. Pale, pale as ashes, all bedaubed in blood, all in gore blood. I swooned at the sight. Corpse, that means corpse, yeah. Um, so she says she saw the body, she saw him be daubed in blood, all on his manly breast. Again, has not clarified who she's talking about. Could be Romeo, could be someone else, which we're about to find out, or Juliet's about to find out. We already know, we're the audience. Juliet, thinking it's Romeo, says, Oh, break my heart, poor bankrupt, break at once to prison eyes, ne'er look on liberty, vile earth, to earth resign, end motion here. And thou and Romeo press one heavy beer. This is an interesting quatrain because she's saying, break my heart, it's bankrupt, break at once. She tells her eyes to go to prison. Don't look on your liberty anymore. Never look on liberty. Liberty is freedom, right? She tells her eyes to go to prison. Basically, they can never look at anyone else again. And then she says, vile earth to earth resign. Here, vile earth is a reference to Juliet's body, the earth of her existence, right? She is, oh, we're all from the earth. Uh, in theory, and so she calls her body vile earth to earth resign. So she talks about um, essentially killing herself, that she should be buried, ending her life, end motion here, that's ending her life, and thou and Romeo, thou her body, and Romeo could press together in one heavy beer. A beer is a funeral bed. So she says, if Romeo's dead, I'm going to die with him. Nurse says, Oh, Tybalt, Tybalt, the best friend I had. Oh, courteous Tybalt, honest gentleman, that ever I should live to see thee dead. And Juliet hears it, finally. Nurse finally says who's actually dead, who the he is. It's Tybalt. And Juliet's confused. She says, what storm is this that flows so contrary? What are you saying that is opposite of what you've been saying? Which is it? Is Romeo slaughtered and is Tybalt dead? My dearest cousin and my dearer lord. Then dreadful trumpet sound the general doom. For who is living if those two are gone? Now she thinks they're both dead. Nurse clarifies finally. Tybalt is gone and Romeo banished. Romeo that killed him. He is banished. Juliet finally realizes what's actually happened. She says, oh God. Did Romeo's hand shed Tybalt's blood? It did. It did. Alas, the day it did. Juliet says, O oh, serpent heart hid with a flowering face, did ever a dragon keep so fair a cave? Beautiful tyrant, fiend angelical, dove feathered raven, wolvish ravening lamb. So you get this series of oxymorons. Romeo's done that before when he was feeling conflicted. She feels very conflicted now. She loved Tybalt. Tybalt was her cousin. Tybalt was her family. And she says that Romeo is a serpent heart hid with a flowering face. He's got a beautiful face, but a serpent heart. She says, did ever a dragon keep so fair a cave? He, he, he seemed fine, but it turns out he was a dragon. He's a beautiful tyrant with these oxymorons. Fiend, angelical. Um, a fiend is like a demon, but it's an angelical demon. Uh, a dove-feathered raven, a lamb that, that eats the wolf. Um, so we have this powerful imagery, this powerful series of images that Juliet, when she finds out that it's Romeo that killed her beloved cousin, beloved, beloved cousin, um, she calls him a fiend angelical. Let's continue. She says, despised substance of divinest show, just opposite to what thou justly seemest. O damned saint, an honorable villain, O oh, nature, what hadst thou to do in hell when thou didst bower the spirit of a fiend in moral paradise of such sweet flesh? Was ever a book containing such vile matter so fairly bound? Oh, that deceit should dwell in such a gorgeous palace. A lot of really powerful images there, really powerful. Calling him a damned saint, an honorable villain. Again, more oxymorons. 
she we return to the idea that a man is a book she says was ever a book containing such vile matter so fairly bound he looked beautiful on the outside but inside was murder murder for her cousin who she truly does love and so her reaction at first is just a disgust surprise at romeo seeming to have been such a nice person seeming to have been so beautiful but on the inside he was a fiend a villain this won't last long she uh she's going to come to some realizations here okay. nurse says is kind of agreeing with her there's no trust no faith no honesty in men all perjured all forsworn all not all dissemblers oh where's my man give me some aquavite aquavite is a liquor by the way so she's like i need a drink um but she says basically because of what romeo has done to tybalt she has no faith in men no faith uh there's no honesty there's no trust all are perjured meaning all are liars all forsworn meaning they've they uh sworn away from um goodness essentially all are nothing all are dissemblers a dissembler is a liar someone who puts himself up as a different kind of person so she says basically based on romeo having murdered tybalt that all men are pigs <laughs> and then she says where's my man i need a drink she says these griefs these woes these sorrows make me old shame come to romeo juliet hears that and it triggers it knocks her out of her her confusion when she's oh i can't believe he is that he's a damned villain nurse says it nurse says shame come to romeo and julia says Bester for such a wish he was not born to shame upon his brow shame is a shame to sit for tis a throne where honor may be crowned sole monarch of the universal earth oh what a beast was i to chide at him okay so juliet instantly turns around and is supporting her husband nurse says will you speak well of him that killed your cousin juliet responds shall i speak ill of him that is my husband ah poor my lord what tongue shall smooth thy name when i thy three hours wife have mangled it so the lord she's talking to is romeo what whose whose voice is going to smooth your name when i after three hours of being married to you have, have spoken ill of you have mangled it but wherefore villain didst thou kill my cousin wherefore again means why why villain did you kill my cousin but then she switches the villain to the cousin that villain cousin would have killed my husband so she's working out the logic in her head as she's speaking it outside that villain cousin would have killed my husband back foolish tears back to your native spring your tributary drops belong to woe which you mistaking offer up to joy my husband lives that tybalt would have slain and tybalt's dead that would have slain my husband all this is comfort wherefore we by then some word there was worse than Tybalt's death that murdered me. I would forget it fain, but oh, it presses to my memory like damned guilty deeds to sinners' minds. Tybalt is dead, and Romeo banish it. Juliet continues to work out her feelings about what has happened in her monologue. She says, That banished, that one word banished, hath slain ten thousand Tybalt's. Tybalt's death was woe enough if it had ended there. Or if sour woe delights in fellowship and needly will be ranked with other griefs, why followed not when she said Tybalt's dead, thy father or thy mother, nay, or both, which modern lamentations might have moved? But with a rearward following Tybalt's death, Romeo is banished. To speak that word is father, mother, Tybalt, Romeo, Juliet, all slain, all dead. Romeo is banished. There is no end, no limit, measured, bound in that word's death. No words can that woe sound. Where is my father and my mother, nurse? This latter half of the of the monologue, where she's working out what it means that Romeo is banished, that that is worse, worse than 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 anything, than ten thousand Tybalt's having been slain. She says, you could have followed with Tybalt's dead with your father and your mother, or both are dead. And that would have been better, kind of messed up, that would have been better than you finishing after saying Tybalt's dead with Romeo is banished. She says, Romeo banished is equal to father, mother, Tybalt, Romeo, Juliet, all dead, all slain. Um, 
So she's she's obviously incredibly upset more at Romeo's banishment than she is about Tybalt. Think about Juliet's roller coaster here, right? She starts out kind of even keeled, kind of right about here. Uh, and then she's really excited because Romeo's coming. And so she's saying, gallop a pace, you fiery footed steeds and talking about her wedding night. Matron Knight is going to teach her uh, how to lose a winning match. And then Nurse comes in saying, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. And all of a sudden, she's down here because she thinks Romeo is dead. And then she's a little bit confused. And then she says, no, it's Tybalt who's dead. And she's like, what, Tybalt's dead? And okay, so Romeo's alive. So she comes up a little bit. But then she finds out that it's Romeo that killed him. She goes back down again. And then Romeo is banished. Oh, she goes down. Okay. She finishes her uh, monologue asking where her mother and father are. The nurse says, weeping and wailing over Tybalt's corpse. Will you go to them? I will bring you thither. I'll bring you there. She says, wash they his wounds with tears. Mine shall be spent when theirs are dry for Romeo's banishment. Take up those cords. Poor ropes, you are beguiled, both you and I, for Romeo is exiled. So she's speaking to the cords, saying that, personifying the, the, the rope ladder as beguiled. Beguiled means confused, tricked, deceived, cheated. The ropes are deceived and cheated just as Juliet feels right now. She says, both you and I, because Romeo is exiled. He made you for a highway to my bed. Again, personifying the rope ladder. He made you for a highway to my bed, but I am made, die, maiden, widow, Ed. Come, cords. Come, nurse. I'll to my wedding bed. And death, not Romeo, take my maidenhead. Nurse says, hi to your chamber, which means get, get yourself to your chamber. I'll find Romeo to comfort you. I walk well where he is. Hark ye, your Romeo will be here at night. All to him, he is hid at Lawrence's cell. The nurse knows where he is. She's going to go get him. She's hoping Romeo will make Juliet feel better as she's mourning this. And then she's, she, uh, Juliet stops her and gives the nurse a ring, a wedding ring. She says, oh, find him. Give this ring to my true knight and bid him come to take his last farewell. All right, so Juliet... The, uh, the action of giving that ring to the nurse, handing it over to her. And when Romeo gets it, he's going to see that Juliet still loves him. Juliet still wants to be his spouse. And so they're to continue on with the plan for the evening, which is the rope ladder and, uh, you know, taking care of business as far as that goes. Um, so Juliet has a, a powerful scene here. Lots of powerful language, beautiful language at the beginning, love language. And she's way up here, as we already illustrated. And then by the end of the scene, she is way down in the dumps. And she's already uh, once talked about um, killing herself, putting her, her corpse next to Romeo's when she thought that he was dead. Okay. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to see how Romeo is reacting. And it's not much better. I'll be honest, not much better. Romeo will be talking to his um, confidant, Friar Lawrence, tomorrow when we pick up with Act 3, Scene 3. All right. In the meantime, go ahead and work on your study guide questions for this. I would definitely practice in vocab.com. You will have a vocab quiz on Friday. Uh, what platform that is going to be on, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I may use vocab.com or I may use Cobb County's uh, teaching and learning system as a, a way to assess you guys. So we'll see. We're figuring this out as we go. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, get outside. Ride a bike. You know, just, you can social distance while still being outside. So, um, yeah, have a good one and uh, keep it real.